much. It's such a privilege to be here this morning. Um, the worship was amazing. I feel like it really set us up for what God wants to do here um, through the word. And so, yeah, it's, it's a real, real honour to be speaking today. Um, for those of you, who was around when I spoke? I think it was about two and a half, maybe three years ago. Who was around when I spoke then? Great, lots of people. Um, now, I would not expect anyone to remember what I was preaching on two and a half, three years ago. I mean, who remembers a sermon from three years ago? But does anyone, by any chance, remember what I was speaking on, other than the leadership team? <laughs> I was speaking on Elijah and Elisha, and I had a bit of a chuckle with God as I was preparing for this, um, because God led me into the passage in 2 Kings 5, uh, which also is about Elisha. And I thought, God, like, we can't do this. These people are going to, anyone that remembers what I spoke on last time is going to either think that it's the only bit of the Bible that I know, or they're going to think, even worse still, it's the only bit of the Bible that I like. And I just want to say for the record that neither of those things is true. I do read more of the Bible. I, you know, I, I, we did Hope Reads last year. We read from Genesis to Revelation. So there is more of the Bible that I do know about. But for some reason, God wanted to bring me back to two kings. Maybe it's the second part of a series. I just don't know. Um, but I had a bit of a chuckle and I thought, okay, well, God, I've got to go with it. So there's something really powerful about reading um, the word of the Lord out loud together corporately. Uh, we're going to stay in this one passage, two kings, and I've got the mighty Joe Hall um, to come and read the passage for us just so that you don't hear my voice all morning. Okay, this is 2 Kings 5. Let me just bring up this small rating. <laughs> the king of Aram had high admiration for Naaman, the commander of his army, because through him the Lord had given Aram great victories. But though Naaman was a mighty warrior, he suffered from leprosy. Now groups of Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl, who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. One day, the girl said to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria. He would heal him of this leprosy. So Naaman told the king what the young girl from Israel had said. Go and visit the prophet, the king told him. I will send a letter of introduction for you to carry to the king of Israel. So Naaman started out taking as gift 750 pounds of silver, 150 pounds of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter to the king of Israel said, with this letter, I present my servant Naaman. I want you to heal him of his leprosy. When the king of Israel read it, he tore his clothes in dismay and said, this man sends me a leper to heal? Am I God that I can kill and give life? He's only trying to find an excuse to invade us again. But when Elisha, the man of God, heard about the king's reaction, he sent this message to him. Why are you so upset? Send Naaman to me, and he will learn that there is a true prophet here in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would surely come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the Abana River and Farpar River of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel put together? Why shouldn't I wash in them? and be healed. So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. But his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says, simply go and wash and be cured. So Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed. And his flesh became as healthy as a young child's, and he was healed. The end. Thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> Story time with Joe Hall. <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Okay, so that, that's quite a long passage, um, but there's some really key things in it that I want us to pick out this morning. And so if you've got a Bible, I'd really encourage you to keep that open. Keep, we're going to keep referring back to it. We're going to pick out different bits, um, and let's just journey through it together. But before we do that, let's, let's just pray. Father, I just want to thank you that you are here with us this morning. I thank you that you want to speak to us through your word. And I pray that you'd really open our hearts and open our minds to the things that you want to kind of reveal to us this morning through this story and the bits that really apply to us and that we can take away and be changed and transformed by. So Lord, I just pray that you would take these words this morning, anything of you, would you let them stick with us? Anything not of you, let them fall to the ground. We just give you this morning and we pray that you would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so there are three three people within this story that I want us to look at this morning. And the first, we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go as quickly as I can without speaking too fast so you can't understand. Um, but the first is the young girl. So who is this young girl in the story? Verse 2 tells us, Now groups of Aramean raiders had invaded the land of Israel, and among their captives was a young girl who had been given to Naaman's wife as a maid. So a bit of background there. The Israelites and the Arameans had been fighting uh, for control of a city east of the Jordan. And they'd finally negotiated a peace treaty, so really they should, be, should have been living in peace with one another. But there still was sporadic fighting, particularly at the border. Um, and so, you know, we, we can see from this, this bit of the verse that there wasn't just fighting, but the Arameans certainly were taking um, some of the Israelites as captives and enslaving them and, and forcing them into kind of, um, you know, forcing them to be domestic maids in their house. So what we have to understand about this young girl that we meet in verse 2 and 3 is that she is in a foreign land. She's away from her family. She's in a position where she's having to serve Naaman's household. And yet despite the fact that she's in this position, which you could see as maybe quite weak and disempowered, here she is in verse 3 saying to her mistress, I wish my master would go to see the prophet in Samaria he would heal him of his leprosy. Now, there are three things that really inspire me about this young girl. And the first is that she absolutely knew her God and what he was capable of. Yeah, so she, she, you know, she had incredible faith in this instance for Naaman's healing. But I think it talked about her faith um, in God that was just completely unwavering. She had no hesitation. She wasn't like, oh, maybe he could go to uh, Elijah. I've heard that maybe he might be able to heal him. She wasn't like, I can't guarantee it, but it's worth a shot. Maybe you should go. She was like, I wish he would go and see this prophet Elisha, for he surely would heal him of leprosy. Her faith was a faith with no hesitation. The second thing about this girl is that she had such courage. I mean, let's think about the situation, right? She's not turning to her peer or to her friend or to a member of her family and saying, you know, uh, you know pointing them in the direction of Jesus and, and, and pointing them in the truth that he could be healed. She was saying to a master, to her master or to her mistress, someone who is in power and authority over her, There was definitely a power dynamic going on here. And yet she had incredible courage to to speak out and to say, you know, I really, I believe that you can be healed. And I really wish you'd go and do that. I work for Tear Fund. It's a Christian uh, charity. And, you know, I sometimes think, oh, I don't really have many opportunities to take, to take a risk. You know, Monday to Friday, I'm in a very Christian culture. Sunday, I'm in church. Saturday is probably the only day that I, I, you know, that I'm probably more in the secular world than I am in the Christian world. But I know that there are many of us here who, um, who are in the secular world Monday to Friday. Stick your hand up if you're in a job or you spend most of your Monday to Friday not around Christians. Yeah, I mean, 95% of our congregation are in that position. And I've heard amazing testimonies of people who have stepped out in courage and of faith. 
I was remembering just the other day as I was preparing for this of, of Jen Winslet. I remember her sharing this amazing testimony of how she stood out in faith in her workplace and asked people whether, you know, whether she could pray for healing. And I just really, I applaud her for that. And I applaud you guys who are out in the, in, you know, in the world, um, living and, and shining your faith and having the faith and the courage to step out and speak out to people about faith. And that is exactly what this, this young girl was doing. And the third thing that really strikes me about this young girl is that despite the fact that Naaman was the man who had taken her captive, she wanted to see God break out in his life. That is so challenging to me. You know, it's easy sometimes to want to see God break out and do things in people who we love and people who are our family, people in this congregation. But it's sometimes harder to want to see God break out into people's lives who actually really, you know, have, have not done well to you or not done right by you. And I think it speaks of this young girl, of her heart of purity that she had to see God work, not just in her friends, but those that have wronged her. So this girl for me, although we only meet her for two verses in this passage, is the hero of the story. You know, it speaks of her faith, her courage, and her pure heart. And it inspires me to step out of my comfort zone and be more like her. It's like this little girl had read Paul's letter to Timothy years before it was written, when he said in 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you teach, the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. I think we can live in a cult, church culture, not necessarily here, but you know, just generally, um, that, that isn't really that convinced that children can, can minister to us. That what they're really capable of in terms of this a supernatural living. David and I um, were really privileged to go to uh, Bethel earlier this year in February. And there were many, many talks at the conference. We went to a prophetic conference and there were many talks that kind of stood out to me. But there was really, there was one that really stood out to me and particularly came back to me as I was preparing for this passage. And it was Amy Gagno. Does anyone know Amy Gagno um, at Bethel? She basically, she heads up the kids' ministry, but for the kids under, um, at preschool, so like the nursery-aged kids. And she has a real heart to... Um, to not just kind of lead a ministry that is, it's funny actually, because Andy said this in the prayer meeting this morning, that not a heart just to lead a ministry that is like a childcare facility, but it's actually a ministry where we're discipling young people, even preschool, to know who they are in Christ and to know that they can hear from God, that they can like actually do healings and miracles because they're the same God lives within them as lives within us. And we don't have to wait for people to get to adulthood or to mature a little before God wants to use us. We see here it was the young girl that points Naaman in the direction of God. And so she, she, like is, she has an insatiable hunger to see young people really raised up in their ministry and to be hearing God. And she's expectant of that. And she shared a story. Um, she said, shared a couple of stories, but we've probably just got time for one. She shared a story um, of how she was preparing to go to a conference where she was speaking about kids ministry and um, kind of what that looked like for her. And she was packing and her kids were in the bath with their, you know, their dad was giving them a bath and they were just splashing in the bath and having fun. And she was packing for the conference and she felt God say to her, I want you to go in and go and ask your children what I want to say to the people at the conference that I'm going to go and speak on. And so she goes in and she goes into the girls and she says, hey girls, you, you know that I'm going to this conference, you know that I'm going to be with lots of people. Um, I just love you just to ask God, what, what does he want to say to these people? And so they were splashing around in the bath and she pulled out her, her phone and she, she put the dictaphone on to, to record kind of what they said. And they had like a couple of words like here and there. And then her sort of slightly older um, child had this slightly longer word. And she said, well, I see, I see this, um, this girl and she's got really big eyes, a medium-sized nose and a really big mouth. And next to her 
is a grandma, and she's got a cane. And then there's these kids that come to, come to her and give her money, and they're giving her money because they want her to be able to buy a house by Christmas. That was the word. So she goes to the conference, and as part of the conference, she, she says, you know, you know, we don't just believe that, God, let, that kids like, have something to give. Like, we're actually practicing that. We're, we're doing it in our everyday lives. And so before I came here, I asked my kids, what do you want to speak to these people about? She pulled out her phone, and she started the recording, and she said, I just want to say, if, if anything speaks to you, then I'd love you just to identify yourself at the end and, and just, just explain kind of what God's saying to you. So she plays it. And she's played that bit, which, um, which, was that, which was that word. And this woman shot up and she said, that's me, that's for me. She said, when I was young, my sister used to describe me like that. She said, she described me as a girl with big eyes, a medium-sized nose and a big mouth because I loved talking. And next to this woman was, a, was another lady and it was her grandma and she had a cane. And she said, the amazing thing is that when this week, before I came to this conference, my children came to me with their piggy banks and they emptied them out onto the table and they said, mommy, I want to give you this money because I want, I want us to be able to buy a house before Christmas. Isn't that amazing? The conference was in February and in January of the following year, Amy gets an email from this lady with pictures of a house that they'd bought and that they were in before Christmas. Come on, yes. These young people can hear God and we have got to be a generation or you know, a congregation that is like expecting our young people to hear God as much, as, as much if not more as we hear him. You know, these young people don't have filters. They just, they say what they, what they hear and they don't kind of weigh it up or get worried about it. And, you know, I just, I really believe that we, we need to be people who um, are wanting to see our kids stand on our shoulders and go higher and further and deeper than we have ever been before. David and I are taking on the ministry Fire Starters. I don't know if any know that in September. Woo! For those of you that don't know what it is, Lynn Halson actually led this incredible ministry for 21 years. She's, um, she's in our house. She's out with the kids today. Um, and it's, it's, it's basically, you know, 50 or 60 young people come away for a weekend together every single month. Um, and they just want to go deeper with God. So they have worship, they've got teaching, they get out on the streets on a Saturday. Um, and yeah, and, 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 they, and they have prophetic workshops. They're just wanting to, to go, they're hungry. They want to go deeper with God and they want to learn what it is to be like that. So, so yeah, so, that's, so that's, that's the first character. This young girl was the one that pointed Naaman to, to, you know, to, his, to his healing. And, you know, let's be, let's be people who are expecting that our young people and that our kids can speak into our lives. The second person that I want to look at is Naaman. Let's read together. This is a bit of a hard one. <laughs> Just a warning. Let's look at verses 9 to 12. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and waited at the door of Elisha's house. But Elisha sent a messenger out to him with this message. Go and wash yourself seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and you will be healed of leprosy. But Naaman became angry and stalked away. I thought he would surely come out to meet me, he said. I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord his God and heal me. Aren't the Abana River and Far, far, far per River of Damascus better than all the rivers of Israel put together? Why shouldn't I wash in them and be healed? So Naaman turned and went away in a rage. Naaman went with a really clear idea in his mind of how God was going to heal him. And when it didn't live up to his expectations or play out as he thought it would, he was so offended and angry that he almost walked away from the blessing and what God wanted to do in his life that day. I don't know if it's just me, 
But that really strikes me as a really key warning to us in this passage. It's a hard one. You know, it's not like if he had walked away that God wouldn't have continued to bless him in his life and continue to work in his life. But I do think that if he walked away that day, he would not have seen his healing that day. Naaman's story could have ended very differently. And one of the things I've learned in my walk with God is that he very rarely does things as I expect him to. (laughs) It's quite frustrating. You think, I've been a Christian for a really long time. You would think that I would kind of get the way of the Lord. But no, he just seems to work in a way that I never quite expect But to be fair, he is quite clear about that in his Bible. You only have to look at the Bible to see that that is what God's like. The people that he chooses. I mean, come on, Moses. He couldn't even speak in public. And yet God chose him to go and speak to Pharaoh to see his people released from slavery. David. I mean, he was the youngest and scrawniest of the sons of Jesse. He wasn't even in the household when they came and chose the person that should go and fight Goliath. He was the youngest. He was the the least obvious choice. And yet he was the one that God had chosen to work that miracle through. And Jesus... There was nothing... It says in Isaiah 53, verse 2, there was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. Jesus wasn't what people were expecting to see, but he was the way in which God um, chose, you know, he, he was God, and yet we, you know, he, 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 he didn't look how people expected him to. And it's not just who God chooses, I think it's also the way he works. Who has examples of God working in the 11th hour. Totally. I don't know why he does it, but he seems to draw it out, draw it out, draw it. I'm sure it's something about trusting, totally trusting him, totally trusting him. And finally, at the 11th hour, it comes through. We have got countless testimonies of God working in that way. (laughs) Or maybe, you know, you're pursuing a track and you think that that is the way that God, you know, that God, that that's the track that God's got you on. And then suddenly a door closes, only for another door to open. You know, we, we, you know, we're trying to pursue God and to pursue what he has for us, but so often things look different to what we are expecting In Isaiah 55, verses 8 to 9, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So we know this in our head, don't we? We, we? we know that God works in unexpected ways or not quite how we're kind of thinking. But it really, I think it's when it gets personal and it's our lives that don't quite work out how we thought they were going to work out, which is when kind of the rubber really hits the road. And I think the key thing in this passage that we need to look at is how we respond in those times. What's our heart's positioning? What's our heart's response to things not quite working out how we thought they were going to work out? Or timings not quite being the time frames that we wanted? Or God asking us to lay down something that we don't really want to particularly lay down, but that's the thing that we need to lay down for the new thing to be able to be picked up. You know, it's these moments in our lives when you know, when it really does get very personal to us that things haven't worked out how we've expected, that we need to examine our heart's response. For Naaman, it didn't look so good. 
for Naaman, his response was really to take offense to how God wanted to work that day. He expected God to heal him in a very particular way. And he says, I thought he'd surely come out to meet me. You know, I expected him to wave his hand over the leprosy and call on the name of the Lord and heal me. And when this didn't happen, he was offended. You know, for Naaman, it looked like him almost physically walking away from the situation. You know, it says, but Naaman became angry and stalked away. And in verse 12, so Naaman turned and went away in a rage. You know, I think that in Naaman's heart, he thought, no, this isn't what I signed up for. This isn't what I thought it was going to be like. I, this, this isn't God. This definitely isn't God. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm out of here. But what does it look like for us when these things hit in our lives? You know, maybe we just dismiss it and we just think, no, 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 well, that can't be God, so we'll just kind of walk in another way. And it's not so big that we ever really notice, but it just kind of takes us off into a different path. But I think for me, it's when something is deeper, when something really hits our core our, our, our core kind of identity or something that is really important and precious to us. When we've been burnt or when things haven't looked like we've expected them to. When we've been offended by God's actions or perhaps maybe his lack of action in a situation. It may look like us physically walking away, but often I think it can look more subtle than that. I think that when things don't pan out how we thought they were meant to or how we'd planned, that sometimes actually it can take a portion of our heart, the bit of the heart that like it's, it's connected to. And I think it can actually sometimes look like us closing that bit of the heart off and not giving God access to it. You know, sometimes that can be conscious and sometimes it can be subconscious. But it's like when you've been holding on to something really tight or it's something that you're really dreaming of or it's something that is so important to you or, it, you know, it's, it's a promise that God has given you that is taking a long time to kind of come into fulfillment. It's at that, those points that we really get tested to know whether we really are wanting to surrender to God's way, whether we're wanting to keep that bit of the heart on the table or whether we kind of take it back and say, do you know, that's too painful. I want to take that back. And, you know, I say this because I can really relate to this one. A couple of years ago, I found myself in a place and there was a deep hurt and offense in my heart towards God. Things haven't worked out as I thought they would. There was a particular error in my life that just didn't look like I thought it would at the time, a breakthrough that I knew God had promised me but hadn't come into fruition. Things were taking much longer than I ever thought that they would. And I really couldn't get my head around why God would be working in this way. You know, I don't want us to get this wrong. Like there are sometimes things that we really have to fight for and it's part of just being in a fallen world that we need to push and we need to fight for the breakthrough. So don't hear that. But I think there are other times when God is actually working in something, but it's just not how we wanted it to work out or what it looked like. And for me, it really took a while. It wasn't something that I could rush. It wasn't something that I was suddenly going to feel okay and be like, okay, you know, I just, I surrender this to God. That's okay. He's got it. I trust him. Because actually it was so deep to me and it was so important to me that it was really quite hard to give that over to God and to surrender to him. And I think it's when things are deep to our core and important to us, something that we really hold dear, that God really understands that it can take a while. He understands that he wants us to be honest and authentic, that we have to journey through the pain of letting go and surrendering to God's ways 
that we have to let go that it's not a quick fix. And actually, I think the journey becomes an important part of the process as we honestly wrestle with God through the disappointment, through the realigning of our expectations, through the acknowledging his sovereignty, through seeing that he, where he was in this world that we hadn't quite imagined for ourselves. But ultimately, we have to come to a place of surrender to give that part of our heart to God and trust him. You know, that's something that, like, that's kind of conscious sort of holding back of our heart or conscious kind of um, not really accepting uh, kind of what God's doing, uh, but, but, you know, kind of having to choose to sort of surrender to that. But I also think it can be subconscious too. For Naaman, it was like he just, he, 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 the prophet told him, this is how God wants to heal you. But he thought, nope, that's not of the Lord. I'm going to keep find, I'm going to keep walking until I find the way that I think is the way that God wants to heal me. I'll just keep looking around for it until I find it. And it's at times at these that I think we need our friends. And it's the, this next bit of the passage that I want us to come on to. Because, you know, luckily for Naaman, uh, things could have looked different for him that day. He could have walked away from the blessing that God wanted to do in his life. But actually, it was because he had people around him that kept him on track. So it says in verse 13, but his officers tried to reason with him and said, Sir, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, wouldn't you have done it? So you should certainly obey him when he says, simply go and wash and be cured. And so in verse 14, so Naaman went down to the Jordan River and dipped himself seven times as the man of God had instructed him to. And his flesh became as healthy as a young child's and he was healed. Woohoo! <laughs> You know, why did, why did Naaman receive his healing? You know, what I love about Naaman is that I, I kind of see him as like one of those, um, I don't know, that's going to sound really, I was going to say like on the continent, Italians and Spanish people are like a lot more kind of emotional, aren't they? And they're kind of a, a lot more impulsive. I know that's a complete generalization, but, but you know, they're a bit more impulsive. And I kind of see Naaman a bit like that. It's like something happens, he's like, Ah, no, that's not the way it's going to be. I'm going to go off in a rage, you know. And then, and then he's kind of got his people around him going, um, maybe we should look at this a different way, you know. And then he calms down and he goes, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're right, you're right, okay, yeah, okay, I'll do it. You know, and I think this is a really important part of this passage is that, you know, we need to have people around us who will speak truth into our lives, who when we can't see things and when we're blinded to things because there's just too much emotion in it or because it's too important to us or because we just can't hear it, we're not seeing right. You know, we need people around us who will speak truth into the situation. I think the amazing thing about these officers is, again, you know, they were in a vulnerable position where he was in charge of them. And, and, you know, I could imagine if I was maybe in that situation, I might have gone, yeah, you're so right. How rude of Elisha and completely validated Naaman's feelings, you know. But no, they, they actually, they challenged him and they, they helped him walk into what God wanted to do in his life that day. They were able to speak into his life and say the challenging things, not just the things that Naaman maybe wanted to hear. And it reminds me really that last week, um, Jan was speaking about small groups and the importance of having people around us. And she, she had two quotes that she put up on the thing. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And Bill Johnson said, if the vision for my life doesn't require the help of others, it's too small a vision. We really need people around us and not just people, as I said, who will agree with us, who will validate our feelings, but we need people who love us, 
who that we can trust, who can really speak those challenging things into our life. Naaman walked into his healing that day, but you know it took two people or two other sets of people to get him there. It took the young girl at the beginning who pointed him in that direction, and it took his officers at the end to kind of help him really go that final way and push him into the promise that God had for him. Who do you have around you that you're allowing to speak into your life? Who have you given permission to say the hard things? Who loves you and will challenge you in love? Who are the people you need around you to run in what God has called, who, who are the people you need you to run with you so that you can run into what God has called you to and who won't let you miss what God is wanting to do in your life? I would encourage you to pursue them, to proactively go after them, to ask people to be those people. It's the sort of thing that actually we have to be proactive in saying, do you know, I spot you. I know that you will love me. I know that you'll say the hard thing and I give you permission to say those things. So as we come into land, because we've only got a few minutes, I want, what's the takeaway from today? As I was preparing, I felt that there are three really distinct people um, in this passage. And I feel like maybe um, different people within the passage are going to speak to different people in the room today. So maybe you really relate to that young girl. Maybe you admire her faith. Maybe you are inspired by her courage. And that's what you want more of today. You want to be someone who will have that level of faith, that unwavering faith, and will speak into people's lives or will offer to pray for people or will, you know, will point people to things in, in real courage that you know that that's what God's asking you to do. Maybe, maybe you want to be that young girl. And, and if you do, I'd really encourage you to come up and just, just get someone to pray with you this morning. Just take, you know, you can do it in your heart, but sometimes I think that we have to take a proactive step and kind of step out and ask someone to pray with us so that we really kind of lock, lock that thing that we're saying to God um, that we want to be more of, like, in our heart. Maybe we've really, really kind of related to the Naaman in this passage. Maybe we need to ask, like, are there things that God said to us that we've walked away from because they've not been what we've wanted to hear? Are there things that God has said to us that we've walked away from because they've not been, because we've not been open to because they haven't looked how we expected them to? Have we shut our heart off to God because he hasn't done things in our time frame or not been what we wanted for our lives or not looked like we thought they should? You know, if, if that, if that kind of part of the passage spoke to you this morning like I'd really encourage you again just to respond in prayer and just ask someone to kind of stand with you in that and and pray with you for that and as I said sometimes those things can actually just be I feel like I just missed it I didn't go the direction God wanted me to but you know I see that and other things are longer for us they're they're hard they they, they go deep and you know and I think it's just important that we recognize that God just wants us to be real in that and maybe it's just that final bit that you have been challenged by, that you actually know that you need people around you in this walk and that you need to, you need to give people permission to speak into your life. And I'd really encourage you to, you know, think about getting involved in a small group. I encourage you to kind of pull people around you who you know will drive you deeper and further and, and higher into your calling and to really proactively pursue them because we can't do this alone and we need, we need others around us to really you know, champion us and, and call us into all that God has for us.